So welcome back. Uh, we're ready to start our afternoon session. Uh, so we have Tudor Dumofta. He will be giving the second lecture as part of his mini course. Thanks. Um, so I actually want to start by finishing up the lecture from yesterday uh, and saying some things about Omega background. Um, let me just recall a few things. Um, so one of the examples yesterday was rosansky witten theory. Um, I don't actually need to say the words rosansky witten theory, um, but let me, let me give that to you as, as an example again. So rosansky witten um, is a 3D TQFT. Um, it's a twist. of 3D n equals 4 sigma model um, to some space x that um, in general needs to be hyperkähler, but for these purposes uh, can just be thought of as a complex symplectic manifold. Um, so it's x and it comes with a holomorphic symplectic form. Uh, the algebra of local operators in this theory um, is Balboca homology of X, which in particular uh, contains functions on X. Um, and in the best possible cases, if X is affine, it only contains functions on X. And this is what is usually called the chiral ring of the physical n equals 4 theory. Um, so yesterday, uh, we talked very generally about products on the operator algebra coming from configuration space. Um, so here, configuration space of two points in R3 is homotopic to a two-sphere. Um, so there are two relevant homology classes. There's a point class, uh, which gives rise to an ordinary product. Um, in this realization, in rosatsky witten theory, um, it is just the commutative product of functions, where f and g in the rosatsky witten example are just holomorphic functions on x. Um, and then there was um, a degree 2 class, which gave rise to a Poisson bracket. Um, and it gave rise very abstractly to a Poisson bracket in any, any 3D TQFT, which in this case is literally the Poisson bracket that comes from the holomorphic symplectic structure. Um, yeah. So, um, in physics, there's this thing called the omega background, um, initially used very effectively by Nekrasov to study instantons um, in, well, to, to study this, the cyber Witten prepotential um, in, in 4D n equals 2 theories. Um, one often hears the words, that Microsoft, uh, the, uh, the Omega background um, is related to quantization. Um, Nekrasov and Shatashvili um, described this in 4DN equals 2 theories, um, and specifically in 3DN equals 4. Um, uh, Junior Yagi wrote a paper a few years ago, um, sort of working at the level of the Lagrangian and turning and de deforming the theory with this Omega background and showing that it leads to. Um, a, a quantization of this chiral ring. Um, there's a really nice perspective on omega background that comes from um, this topological configuration space formalism. Um, 
omega background amounts to choosing an axis. This is omega background in three dimensions. Um, amounts to choosing an axis in R3 and working equivariantly uh, with respect to rotations about this axis, some equivariant parameter epsilon. Um, what one finds upon deforming the Lagrangian of the theory um, is that the rosansky witten supercharge, um, the topological supercharge no, no longer squares to zero, uh, but squares to, it, it acts like and the variant differential, um, it squares to epsilon um, times um, an infinitesimal rotation in space-time. Um, sorry? Epsilon's a parameter. I should really say, I, maybe I should say V. v. Um, Um, so, in, intuitively, um, as, um, as Sergei and Satoshi mentioned, um, this leads to a quantization of the algebra of operators just because the, when you compute equivariant cohomology you, in the Carton model, um, you look at invariant objects and then apply the differential to invariant objects. And the invariant operators have to sit on, on the line. Um, and so, whereas you used to be able to move them around each other any way you wanted, um, now they're, they're stuck to the line and they can't continuously move past each other, and so it looks like the algebra should get quantized. Um, now, in terms of these uh, ED algebra structures, uh, what one would expect to see is an E3 algebra, local operators in the 3D TQFT deforming to an E1 algebra, local operators on a line. Um, I have, I, so, all, all I need to say at the moment um, is that it is, um, it is a deformation of the entire quantum field theory uh, depending on a continuous complex parameter epsilon um, that, among other things, um, causes um, a supercharge, causes the topological supercharge to no longer be nilpotent, but to square to epsilon times a rotation. So, what does omega background mean um, in this abstract topological formalism? Um, So for epsilon not equal to zero, um, products um, products in the topological algebra um, are now controlled um, not by homology classes in configuration space, but, but by equivariant homology classes in configuration space. Um, this, this rotation in space-time induces um, a rotation in configuration space, and so it makes sense to consider equivariant homology. Um, if we spell out what that means uh, in three dimensions, um, so in uh, E1 equivariant homology of S2, where S2 is the same S2 that appeared on the left, it's the configuration space of two points in R3. Um, 
So, so there used to be a single point class, a single product. Now there are two distinct point classes. Um, so we have. point classes corresponding to the north and south poles. Um, of, of the sphere, uh, which are not equal. Um, and they lead to two different products, two different primary products. Um, the North Pole corresponds to two operators sitting in one order along the axis, and the South Pole corresponds to the two operators sitting in the other order. Um, the point classes are not equal, but they do satisfy a relation. Their difference um, is epsilon uh, times the class of the two-sphere. Um, and at least when I first encountered this, the formula for me was much more familiar from equivariant cohomology, yes? I mean, they're, they're just... So, so here, um, I'm looking for binary operations, and there's a non-commutative product is the same as saying you have two different products. There, there are two orders in which I can... There, there are two binary operations depending on which order I, I choose. And that, that's the way it's showing up here. Um, each, each class defines a, a binary operation. Um, so the, this formula was much more familiar to me from equivariant cohomology, and if you're coming from physics, it probably would be. So let me, um, as an aside, um, this is the localization formula in equivariant cohomology of S2. Um, what you actually see is that a delta function class on the North Pole, um, it's like this, so delta function class on the South Pole is equal to 1. Um, in, in cohomology. Um, it's, the, it's the localization of the fundamental class uh, a la Atiyah Bhatt. Um, anyway, there's a relation like that. The difference is controlled by epsilon times the class of S2. And if we look at what that means in terms of operators, it's, it's precisely saying um, the difference between the two primary products Um, is, is epsilon times the bracket. Um, and that's, that's quantization. Um, so, so not only do you see non-commutativity in omega background, but it, it's directly related to, um, to a deformation quantization of, uh, of this uh, Poisson structure. Um, one, one thing I should say, it looks like this formula is Usually in quantization, this isn't exact equality. It's this plus higher orders in epsilon. Um, the reason you don't see higher orders in epsilon here um, is because everything in sight has been deformed. Um, so, um, so there's an algebra that depends on epsilon, um, and there's a secondary product that deforms that depends on epsilon. So in the limit that epsilon goes to zero, this becomes the usual secondary product, the Poisson bracket. Um, but which is, anyway, and that's, that's what one means by quantization. Cool. All right. Um, story finished. Um, I will move on to the planned lecture for today if there are no questions. Sorry? Um, then it becomes commutative. Well, the, but, but there's an epsilon, so, so the right-hand side becomes zero. 
And right, I mean, as, if epsilon goes to zero, the north and south pole classes become equal, and and so everything becomes commutative. Uh, if maybe a more reasonable thing to do is that, um, and then you want to say as epsilon becomes zero, um, this just becomes the ordinary Poisson bracket, um, and you can get that as a limit of of the commutator divided by epsilon. Um, yeah, I think that that's an awesome um, that, that's an awesome question. Um, I, I don't know in general how to do it yet. So, so in the theory of deformation quantization, um, an, an important question is whether a deformation of an algebra is flat. Um, that's, that's an even more basic thing than expanding this out in epsilon. Um, f flat is in the sense, uh, in, in the sense that, that you don't lose any operators at, at non-zero epsilon. Um, that that things that that it, that everything is smooth as as epsilon is turned on, and um, we are honestly st still looking for for the right physical criteria to get that. Um, there are clearly some cases where it is and some cases where it isn't. Um, in rosansky witten theory, uh, where your target has some extra symmetry, it looks like this has to be flat, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to get a more general answer to that, and I would also love to see an explicit formula for 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 the expansion of this, because it, it would it would have some very um, nice theoretical implications. It, it would give it would give a way or sort sort of a new definition that should be compatible with old definitions of deformation quantization to to quantize to quantize an algebra. Um, n no, uh, yes, uh, sorry, um, I think that is the same thing, yes. Sorry, it's not. It's not. It's not quite the same thing. Flat, flat is a little bit. Is, is a little bit less. Um, um, it may. Because generally, what what you might have is just just some sort of infinite series of terms. Um, and and I I, th I think one can still talk about flatness in that that context. Um, so I think it is a little a little bit weaker. Yes. Um, y yes. Um, as far as I can tell, yes. Um, um, but I may be. And I, I will invoke the fact that that if if I actually do an omega deformation in physics, epsilon is a number. Um, and and so so I would certainly expect this to be valid for finite epsilon, but I may be mi missing some some mathematical subtlety. So as I mean, uh, yes yes I I think so, but. Sure. Yes. Um, so, so in in principle, computing it I, I th is straightforward. It's just the computation is hard. So, 
So what you're supposed to do is deform, deform the Lagrangian, um, work in the deformed theory, um, and then um, look, at, look at what the equivariant, um, equivariant class of S2 is. That's a, that's a linear combination of ordinary classes of epsilons. Um, Yes, absolutely. No, no, but but, the, but this definition, but it's the same definition. It's it's descent. You um, you you take descendants and integrate. Um, it just every so so everything should be done in, in equivariant homology and cohomology, but but it, it's take descendants and integrate. Um, so so the, I mean the, this 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 line is a definition of products. Um, of, it's a definition of operations on local operators in, 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 in the deformed quantum field theory. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yes, but also, uh, there's the statement that in... Um, in, in this quantum field theory, every class in equivariant cohomology gives you a, a very concrete way to, to construct a product. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um. Yes, I don't think it depends on it at all. Um, okay. Um, okay. Let me. Yeah, I, I, I think there are. Um, I well, I'm I think writing a provocative formula on the board is kind of fun, uh, but I, I think there there are a, a lot of nice concrete things to, to, to actually do with this. Um, um, so so th there, there are subtleties uh, as far as like, Q mu and P mu. P mu is no longer a symmetry. Um, neither is Q mu. Once you turn on the omega background, that's fine. Um, but there's still operators that act on the theory, and, and you can play the same sorts of games. Um, but but there are there are subtle questions to to start answering. Um, so, sorry. Oh, it's it's a it's a vector field. Um, so. The the setup is that there there is a deformation of the theory um, that looks like um, that looks like we're going to start working equivariantly with respect to to the action of this vector. Yes. Um, uh, I can't remember now whether or not you can actually do that in general. Um, you sh I sort of think you should be able to. Yes, uh, you can. You can form. I mean, it, it's it's the question of how you how you deform Q, and but then you need to make sure there's a corresponding deformation of the action. Um, be, being able to deform Q is actually not not that bad. You you use Q mu um, times times the vector field. Um, okay. Cool. Um, Right, so the next topic um, is a different manifestation of, of higher structure um, now related to group actions in quantum field theories. Um, um, and I'm actually going to go through a um, a really simple example, it's simple but, but sort of fundamental, um, of, 
um, how this works in quantum mechanics, in one, the simplest one-dimensional um, quantum field theories. Um, so this is, this is also work with um, David Benzvi and Andy Neitsky um, and Chris Beam and Matt Bollimore. Um, if I get to saying anything about causal duality at the end, um, that is also inspired by discussions with Kevin Costello and David Gaiotto. Um, I'm uh, not optimistic that I'll get to that. Um, so I want to say some things about um, the structure of quantum mechanics with G-symmetry um, and uh, what gauging and ungauging means uh, from a topological perspective. Um, and then, so one of the themes by the end of this is that G actions in D dimensions are controlled by pure gauge theory in D plus one dimensions. Um, and whenever a theory has a G symmetry, you should think of it as a boundary condition for pure gauge theory in D plus one dimensions. Um, so in this, in this context, we're, we're dealing with supersymmetric quantum mechanics um, in, D plus, in two dimensions, we'll encounter the Foucault category um, of pure gauge theory which in a stacky derived way, one might call the Fukai category of point mod G. Um, let me begin with a bit of review um, of N equals two, uh, A type uh, supersymmetric quantum mechanics um, whose um, geometry was studied long ago by, by Witten and many others. Um, so um, A-type quantum mechanics, um, simplest examples of this are sigma models. It's a 1D sigma model um, whose target uh, is Uh, is any um, smooth Ramanian manifold X. And to keep things simple in this talk, I'm going to assume that X is compact. Um, that's, not, um, that's not strictly necessary. Um, a maybe a slightly more precise way to talk about this, since, since it's supersymmetric, we don't just have X, but we have some fermions around. Um, and so one can think of this as a particle um, field configurations in this one-dimensional theory describe a particle moving uh, in the odd tangent bundle of X. That's, that's where the fermions come in. Um, good. Um, the Hilbert space in this theory is functions on the odd tangent bundle. In other words, the Duram complex of X. Um, the Hamiltonian in yesterday's notation, I would have called it translation in the time direction um, is the form Laplacian. Um, and there's a supersymmetry algebra that involves a Q and a Q bar that if I, if I keep, if I stick to my graded notation, they anti-commute to translations and they're realized on the, geometrically on the Hilbert space as the Duram differential and its Hodge dual. Um, and of course, these, these anti-commute to, to the form Laplacian. Uh, note also that there's a grading Um, there's a, a z-valued fermion number 
uh, or a U1R symmetry um, around. Um, that's just the, the usual uh, cohomological grading in, in the Duram complex. Um, and then one can take cohomology and define the supersymmetric Hilbert space uh, or the, the topological Hilbert space, I'll call it supersymmetric here, um, as the Q cohomology um, of, of the full Hilbert space. In other words, the Duram cohomology of, of X. And one of the nice things um, described uh, in one of Witten's early papers on this um, is that the, well, the Hodge theorem relates um, Duram cohomology of X to the space of harmonic forms on X. Um, harmonic forms are uh, the things killed by, by the Hamiltonian. Um, and so this, uh, this Q cohomology of the full Hilbert space gives you the space of ground states in the, the physical um, quantum mechanics theory. Things killed by, uh, by P. Okay. Um, great. So that's, that's the general setup. Um, there's also a familiar story involving gauge symmetry. So suppose we have an action of G of, of this is going to be a compact Lie group um, on X uh, by Hamiltonian isometries. Not, sorry, there's no Hamiltonian, by, by Riemannian isometries. Um, and from the topological viewpoint, you don't really care whether it's acting by Riemannian isometries or not. But in order to think of this as a symmetry of, of the physical theory that where everything depends on metric, you do want isometries. Um, so if, if we have a G action on X, um, then there is a G action on the entire theory, and we can gauge um, this symmetry. Yeah, so, so initially, um, just having a G action on X uh, implies that the theory has a global symmetry. Um, and I've formulated the next two parts of the talk in, in, in different orders. Um, so I will talk about the global story afterwards. Um, I want to mention the gauge story now because it's actually more familiar and, and well established. Um, so gauging the symmetry means uh, introducing uh, a G connection. on FaceTime, on R. Um, uh, so that's going to involve a connection, but there's supersymmetry involved. So there are some super partners. Um, in particular, um, one of the super partners is a complex Lie algebra valued scalar field that will play an important role. Um, I should say, also say it's a scalar field of degree of fermion number two. Um, and we use this, uh, we use the connection on R to covariantize our maps uh, into X or into the odd tangent bundle. Um, Um, then, so, so this part is not yet gauging. This is introducing something new in the theory. Um, the gauge part um, is doing the path integral over all fields modulo gauge transformations. In other words, all maps into X modulo gauge transformations. Now, 
in one dimension, uh, gauge transformations can be used to, to completely kill the connection. Um, and then all we have left um, are global constant gauge transformations along R. Yes? Um, which, which one? Um, so, um, one way to think about this geometrically um, is to do everything on super manifolds. Um, and then what we're introducing is a super connection. Um, physically, you know that, that the gauge multiplet um, ha has to involve some, some extra fields. Um, and in particular, it involves this, this scalar. Um, Um, no, that is that is right. Um, I, I think that is right. Um, it's there. There may be actually. Yeah, sorry. There, there are some additional, like two copies of this. But then, when you quantize, you choose a polarization, and then you're only looking at functions on. Um, no, I think I think that's actually. I think that 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 is actually the target. Um, but I'm not going to be able to, to go through and tell you exactly how to build the super connection. Um, I, I thought about it very briefly at one point and then just decided to stick with super fields in physics, which, which is about the same thing. But yeah, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's it. Yes. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, there, there, there may be some very slick geometric way to say it, but, but I think yeah, Jacques's right. You just use, use superspace. Sorry, there may be some some slick derived geometry way to say it, but um, yeah. Um, I, I would be happy to know a. A slicker way to say it I should say that I'm not trying to dismiss it. I just just don't know, don't know how to do it. Um, off off the top of my head. Um, all right. Um, so um, so we can soak up gauge transformations almost entirely by by killing the connection, uh, but sigma is left. Um, the um, the Hilbert space of the theory. Roughly, this is not quite true, um, but it will be quasi-isomorphic to what I'm about to write down. Um, the Hilbert space of the theory can be modeled on um, forms on X, um, and uh, polynomials in this field sigma that's left over. Um, and dividing by, by these residual G transformations means we should make sure everything is, is G invariant. Um, the uh, differential acting on this uh, is the exterior derivative um, plus uh, sigma times contraction with a vector field that generates the G action on X. Um, and so if I'm Careful about it, V is an element of G dual um, tensor uh, vector fields on, on X. Um, and then you immediately recognize this as the Carton model uh, for equivariant cohomology. So 
uh, the QCO homology in gauge theory, if you write that as HG, um, is the equivariant cohomology of, of X. Um, now, let me recall some, some useful facts. Um, there, uh, you quantize what amounts to the cotangent bundle of this thing. Um, so, so you end up with functions on the odd tangent bundle, and, and that, that gives you forms. Oh, yeah. So, so sorry. So I, I skipped. I skipped some steps, um, and I, I didn't talk about how you, you actually quantize the theory to produce the Hilbert space. So, so there's there's a what was there's a geometric quantization procedure involved, uh, where you you solve the equations of motion on a little bit of, on a little slice, um, and and quantize that space. Um, so. What, what you find is that you can describe states as functions of the bosonic fields, not the momenta, um, and half of the fermions. And that, that half of the fermions um, amounts, to, uh, amounts to the form in indices. Yes. Um, no, I mean one acts on the other. So, um, so, so yes, there is a connection because forms act on forms by by wedge. Um, but uh, there is more. So, so the operators in this theory are not just not just forms on X. Um, it's the operators in this theory are forms on X times X, uh, which act on forms on X by convolution. Um, so, so the operators are, are a little bit bigger, but they do contain forms on X. Um, yes. Um, that's right. So, so this is. Um, so, in part, it's my oversimplification. Um, you you do actually have sigma bar, as as well, and I've I've killed it because um, there's a differential that relates sigma bar to a fermion, and I've I've removed them entirely. Um, I should also point out that as far as a sigma goes, as far as the vector multiplet goes, um, this looks like a Dalbo type quantum mechanics. Um, and so, so where, whereas we get real functions on X, we'll get holomorphic functions on, uh, on what's effectively the Coulomb branch of, of the theory. Um, OK. Um, so. Let me um, just recall a few facts about equivariant cohomology. Um, if uh, the g-action on X is free, um, then uh, equivariant cohomology on X is just ordinary cohomology on the quotient. In other words, if the quotient is smooth, then um, then one can just use uh, ordinary cohomology on the quotient, and that, that makes physically intuitive sense. Um, when we gauge a G symmetry, we're dividing out by G transformations. Um, and so we roughly expect to get the theory whose target is X mod G. Um, the, um, the subtlety is that 
um, if x mod g is singular, um, that is not itself a reasonable model for, for quantum mechanics. We have to resolve the singularity somehow, and the right way to do it is to, to compute equivariant cohomology. Um, so if, conversely, if the action is not free, uh, usually, well, uh, usually these things aren't equal, um, and the difference um, accounts for the existence of a Coulomb branch in, in quantum mechanics parameterized by the sigma field. Um, in nice cases, um, what is called equivariantly formal, Um, for example, uh, if x is symplectic um, and the g-action has isolated fixed points, sorry, the g-action is by Hamiltonian isometries and has isolated fixed points, um, the equivariant cohomology um, is the ordinary cohomology times G invariant polynomials in sigma. Um, and so that's sort of the extreme opposite case from the G action being free. If the G action is free, you just quotient. Um, if the G action has isolated fixed points in this nice way, um, then we get what the entire Hilbert space that we used to have times these polynomials, which are just sitting around there um, and, and don't interact. Um, so one particular example is when GX trivially, but, but there, there are many more cases than, than just when, when GX trivially. So, 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 so yes, it looks, like, it looks like G is acting trivially, but, but it holds more generally. Um, you you do, and that's that's uh, that's totally compatible with 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 this. Um, yeah. Um, so I mean, the the localization formula has has a lot more detail in it. It's telling you how to how to write everything in in terms of delta function classes. But what does localization actually do? It, it tells you that you can write the entire cohomology ring in terms of the fixed points. The fixed points are generating this, but you also have polynomials in sigma that, that in this case, are actual, they're distinct states in, in your Hilbert space. Yes? Um, because when you have a symplectic space with such a G action, the cohomology localizes. Um, The, sorry, I mean, right, that's true. Um, I mean, just write down, just, just look at the, look at S2. Um, and, the, and the example we were talking about before, and, and, and it, it works, it works exactly this way. Um, there, there are two, I mean, it's, this, this is general, there, there are the two fixed point classes, that's a two dimensional space, and then there's, arbitrary polynomials. And so you can, gen you can describe the entire cohomology, equivariant cohomology ring by, by combining fixed point classes with polynomial coefficients. It, it, it is not. I mean, the, this... But... Yes, in, in that, yes, in that, for example, you can describe the fundamental class um, as, as a sum of fixed points. So, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, yes. Ex exactly. That. No. No. That. That's. That's. 
That's what that means. Um, so um, so there, there are tons of spaces for which the equivariant cohomology looks really stupid. Um, it looks like G is acting trivially. Um, and there, there are many, many spaces with, with this property. Yes? Um, yes? Yes. Um, cool. Um, I'm glad I mentioned that. Um, so um, there's, well, there's there's one more useful fact that um, at least in physics is understated. Um, the supersymmetric Hilbert space in, these, in this case, or so, equivariant cohomology, um, is naturally a module. For this polynomial algebra, this is a free polynomial algebra constructed out of the the. Uh, out of invariance in sigma. Um, to mathematicians who have seen equivariant cohomology, this is an obvious thing, and it's, it's one of the first things you learn. Um, this mathematically is uh, G equivariant cohomology of a point. It's the thing you get when you have a trivial G action. Um, it's sort of clear from from this complex that, that you will get this, polynomials in sigma act. Um, physically, the way I like to think of this um, is that um, in this quantum mechanics, polynomials in sigma are local operators. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're part of, part of the algebra of topological operators. They commute with each other and they all act on the Hilbert space. Um, and so naturally, the Hilbert space is a module for polynomials in sigma. Um, now, um, give you some instructive examples. Um, in the case where Um, where the space is equivariantly formal, so if we consider S2 with a rotation about an axis, um, then this is a free module. Um, it's, a, it's free of rank 2. Um, polynomials just, just multiply. Um, on the other hand, um, what if we consider uh, an action that is the opposite of trivial, an, act an action that is free, for example, uh, rotations of a circle? Uh, well, then on one hand, we know that we can just go ahead and quotient and find the cohomology of a point, in other words, C. Um, but that is forgetting the module structure. Um, and if one keeps track of what happens to sigma, a better way to write this is as polynomials in sigma mod sigma. Um, so this copy of C is actually coming out, um, well, it's acted on by polynomials in such a way that sigma is set to zero. Um, Physically, since I don't think I'm going to finish this lecture in time anyway, and I'll move on tomorrow, I should say physically, um, what's happening is that the well is that the Coulomb branch is being killed. Um, the the fact that the action is free means literally that there's a, there's a term in the Lagrangian that masses out the field sigma; it gets set to zero, and that's what's being reflected here. Um, One more example. Um, consider S3 
um, as, as a hop vibration with a U1 action on the fibers. So this is, again, a free action. Um, and the U1 equivariant cohomology of S3 um, should be, in the naive way, as a vector space, is just going to be the cohomology of the quotient. In other words, C2. Um, but if you're smart about it, you remember the module structure. This is polynomials in sigma modulus sigma squared. Um, so now sigma is still being set to zero, but in a slightly less trivial way. It takes some effort to, uh, to get it there. Okay. Um, so that was an old story. Let me, let me move on to, to the new one. So it's a new story in physics. It's actually still old in math. Um, this is a physics realization of uh, work of Gorski, Kotwitz, and McPherson um, talking about the structure of equivariant cohomology. Um, in physics, so it's, it's, this is a structure that exists in quantum mechanics um, that I'm about to talk about that I think has just not, um, not really been explored at all. Um, it is, however, super simple. So let me now talk about global symmetries. Um, so this is a global symmetry is what you get if you have a g-action on x and do nothing. Um, what is the extra structure that the Hilbert space gets just by knowing that there's a g-action on x? Well, um, the Lie algebra, um, infinitesimal uh, g transformations, um, acts on uh, the full physical Hilbert space, forms on x, uh, via the Lie derivative. Um, and the Lie derivative commutes with the exterior derivative. Awesome. Um, that means that the Lie algebra action should descend to cohomology. Um, should act on the supersymmetric Hilbert space. Um, in other words, Um, cohomology um, is a representation of G. But there's also Carton's formula um, that says that, that the Lie derivative is not just Q closed, but it's in fact Q exact. Um, there's this operation of contracting with the vector field, um, and applying our supercharge to that, we get the Lie derivative. Um, so in fact, since the Lie derivative is Q exact, um, it acts trivially on cohomology. Um, and will be a trivial representation of the Lie algebra. Um, so that sounds kind of boring, which is, I think, why nobody talks about G symmetry, G global symmetry, and supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Um, the cool thing is that that's not the end of the story. So, but what we learned yesterday um, was that whenever an operation is trivial in homology, um, it may be non-trivial at the level, and that leads to higher operations. And there are indeed higher operations around. Um, so um, the upshot is that for any cycle on the group, um, we get uh, an operator.
on the physical Hilbert space that decreases form degree by the dimension of that cycle. Um, let, me, let me try to define that. So, so yesterday we did descent and configuration space uh, because the sort of action we were talking about um, was trivial in configuration space. We were talking about translations, moving operators around, and those were motions in configuration space. Now, we're talking about moving, moving in G being trivial, a G action being trivial, and so what we're going to find are forms on the group that we end up integrating on cycles on the group. Um, yes, because sigma is literally in exactly the same sense that, this, that you would do it in, in higher dimensional supersymmetric theories. Um, sigma is a, Lie, you know, is a complex Lie algebra scalar. It should parametrize a Coulomb branch. Um, when when the, matter, the matter fields are zero, um, if we were allowed to analyze this classically, um, if when... Um, when the matter fields are sitting at a fixed point of the action, sigma is unconstrained, and, and there is a classical moduli space uh, parameterized, uh, parameterized by it. Um, So that's a double quantum mechanics statement, uh, which is sitting in a different world. Um, right, and in double quantum mechanics, you do get all representations of G, but that's because the Hilbert space is double cohomology, not Duram. So, so the lead derivative is trivialized in Duram cohomology because of this formula, but there's no, there's no similar formula for the, for the double operator. Um, which is the sort of quantum mechanics you're talking about. Um, so, so if I were doing B-type quantum mechanics, then, then I would have stopped. Um, I would have stopped here. Um, and the Hilbert space is an interesting representation of G, and then you don't have this higher stuff. Um, great. Um, so let me... Um, and before the end of this, try to define this action. Um, so, uh, given a one cycle on G, um, we can act with it on a form by doing the following thing. Well, just like yesterday we applied Q mu, um, here we're going to apply the thing that trivializes the lead derivative. We apply contraction with V. Um, now, what sort of object is this? V was um, valued in G dual, the dual of the Lie algebra. Omega is, of course, a form on X. Degree has shifted by one. Um, if I ignore the form on X part, the G dual tells me that I actually have something sitting in the cotangent bundle of the group at the identity. Um, I can then smear this, I can use the G action on G uh, to smear this into a one form um, over the entire group. Um, that's an averaging procedure um, that I'm not going to write explicitly because I'm running out of time. Um, but this can be promoted to a one form on G. Um, if omega is invariant under the G action, then there's actually nothing to be done. And then we integrate it along the cycle. Um, and similarly, uh, for a K cycle, Um, we do the same thing, we just apply IV multiple times. Yes? Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. So, so, so hitting, I, hitting it with IV is, is descent. Um, n not, not here. Um, okay. Um, so, where am I? Um, if we pass to, well, first we can pass to cohomology. So these gamma operations commute with exterior derivative, um, and that's that's a simple identity involving Lie derivatives. Um, um, so the gammas act on supersymmetric ground states. Um, and now the action can be non-trivial. Um, on supersymmetric ground states, moreover, only the homology class of these cycles in the homology of G matters. Um, so what we end up with is an action of the homology of G on the cohomology of X. Uh, in other words, the cohomology of X is a homology of G module. Um, now, one is, at least I was, not usually used to thinking of the homology of G as an algebra. Um, there's this very simple way to see that. Um, it comes from what's called the Pontryagin product. There's a multiplication operation um, from G times G to G that induces a push forward in homology. Homology of G times homology of G to homology of G. Um, and that's the product. Um, a nice fact is that um, this algebra, the homology of G, is always an exterior algebra um, on, I think, rank G generators. Um, so it's freely generated uh, by a bunch of fermions of different degrees. Um, cool. So that's the claim. Um, whenever there is a global G symmetry in quantum mechanics, the Hilbert space is a module for this fermionic algebra. Uh, physically. Um, acting on invariant forms um, uh, gamma is the same thing as uh, as contracting with v uh, these these integrals just renormalize by a constant um, um, and the the one cycle sort of gamma is the same thing with, as, as acting with IV. Um, and this is uh, a particular fermion uh, in the current multiplet. So one thing we do learn in physics is that whenever there is a global G symmetry, there is a current. And if we have supersymmetry, there is an entire current supermultiplet. Um, and IV is sitting in the current supermultiplet. Um, when acting on forms that aren't invariant, uh, one has to do this smearing or averaging procedure that looks non-local on the target, um, and the operator can't be described quite so simply. Um, minutes left. I think, really. Um, Um, so, so, I mean, that, that's, uh, no, um, there are no gay genos. 
um, there's, there's, no, there's no gauge multiplet. Um, so, so it's represented by fermions and it's superpartners of the original fields. It's whatever the superpartners of the current are. Um, and and that, that will, of course, depend on how G is acting. Um, yeah, no, there's, there's no, like, there's no extra vector multiplet or, or anything. I'm not gauging the theory. It's, it's just the old quantum mechanics with the G symmetry that happens to have this canonical extra structure. Um, examples. Um, let me uh, start with a U1 action on the circle again. So now the physical Hilbert space involves zero forms and one forms with an exterior derivative going one way and gamma going back. So gamma is just U1 itself treated as, as a one cycle. Um, passing to cohomology, well, the exterior derivative is gone, but we still got this gamma operation. Um, so, in fact, um, the um, in this case, the supersymmetric Hilbert space, uh, which we sort of stupidly thought was cohomology of S1, is not just cohomology of S1, but it's an exterior algebra on two generators as a module over itself. Um, If we do the same thing with S2, we find a strikingly different situation. S2 with a U1 action. Um, the, uh, the full Hilbert space contains 0, 1, and 2 forms with an exterior derivative going that way and gamma going back. Uh, but the supersymmetric Hilbert space just has two copies of C with nothing in the middle, and gamma can't do anything. Um, so here, um, the supersymmetric Hilbert space is C2 uh, with a trivial. Um, and the fact that this action is trivial is directly related to the statement about um, equivariant cohomology, the fact that the co equivariant cohomology of S2 is, is formal, um, that it looks like G is acting trivially. Um, the relevant, what you need to know is not that G itself is acting trivially, but it, that it's acting trivial in a topological sense. In other words, that this action of the homology is trivial. Um, one more example. This isn't quite the end of the story. Um, let's do the hop vibration again. Yes. Um, it's too big. Um, it'll be zero for degree reasons. Um, uh, gamma will have degree minus three uh, for, for SU2. There's Right, the, the only homology class on SU2 is the degree 3 class. And so you jump three steps and, and nothing interesting happens. Um, but you can ask the same thing. Um, um, you can ask the same thing here with, with an SU2, uh, and the answer will be different. Um, so, uh, but let me just consider U1 for the moment. So U1 acting on the fibers in the hop vibration. Um, so we have zero forms, one forms, two forms, three forms, um, and um, a supersymmetric Hilbert space that consists of two copies of C, and you might want to say 
the same thing should happen. There's no way that gamma is going to reach. And that's true. Um, however, something cool happens. Uh, because the cohomology vanishes, the exterior derivative is an isomorphism in the middle. Um, and so while gamma doesn't reach across, gamma d inverse gamma does. Um, and so there's, there's actually an operation of degree 3 that goes all the way. Um, and you could also get this operation by using SU2 instead of U1. Um, and, and looking at the top class in SU2. Um, right, so when gamma vanishes, we can even have these higher operations. They all have odd degrees. Um, here it's degree minus 3. Um, and the full statement is that the supersymmetric Hilbert space um, is not just um, a homology of G module, but it's a homology of G A infinity module. Um, and these are, the, um, these are the higher A infinity operations. Um, so we call this gamma 2. Um, so there, there's a gamma, uh, there's a gamma 2, gamma 3, and so on. That, that can play a role. Um, and then there's the, the theorem by, by Gorski, Kotwitz, and McPherson, uh, which I will interpret physically tomorrow, um, is that uh, equivariant, or one theorem, uh, is that equivariant uh, cohomology is formal. In other words, it looks like G is just acting trivially uh, if and only if. Um, the cohomology uh, is a trivial uh, H, H of G A infinity module. Um, so when we looked at equivariant cohomology of S3, we got polynomials in sigma modulo sigma squared. So sigma was not set to zero, but sigma squared was set to zero. We had to work a little more. Um, and that's directly... Uh, that's dual to this statement, that uh, gamma is zero, but in fact there's a higher operation um, that that connects these these two copies of. Okay, thanks. Questions. Do I view this gamma as objects in the Foucault category of the uh, of BG and this A infinity coming from the infinite structure of that? Yeah, exactly. So, well, so what's going to happen um, is, is that it's it's natural to associate Ramanian manifolds with the G action to boundary conditions for pure gauge theory in two dimensions, um, and. Um, Boundary conditions for two-dimensional theories have A infinity algebras of operators living on them. Um, I, the gammas show up. We're going to we're going to play sandwich games. Um, so if if you start with a boundary condition and want to recover ordinary quantum mechanics, you have to sandwich it with a Dirichlet boundary condition. Um, and what's going to happen is that the gammas canonically live on the Dirichlet boundary condition, and when you form the sandwich, they will they will they will act on the Hilbert space of Anyway, that's, I will talk about that on Friday. Uh, but it is, it is, yeah, the A infinity is, is specifically coming up because um, these, these are going to end up being boundary conditions in 2D. Um, I, well, sort of. Um, it, I, to be more honest, A infinity should, should actually have come up in quantum mechanics before people started talking about Foucault categories. D derived, I mean, derived categories and A infinity categories just are natural in quantum mechanics to begin with. But, um, yeah. What is the Fukaya category of point mode G? Or are you going to tell us next time? Sorry? What is the Fukaya category of point mode G? Um, I'll, I'll tell you tomorrow. Yes, next time. Okay, I don't see any further hands, so let's thank Tudor again. Okay.